Hello, hello. Happy Saturday. Can I have an Instagram moment? everybody. I am so happy you've joined us today. Everything we do at the Brooklyn Museum is done with a passionate belief in art and artists, so it is an honor to be here today with two deeply inspiring artists who have used their art for true social good. Not only do they believe in the primacy of the experience between art and the viewer, they believe in the power of art to transform culture, society, and even policy. And each of them is contributing to greater goodness in the world with empathy and understanding. Everything Tanya Bergera does, performances, sculptures, public art, is motivated from a sense of urgency to fight oppression and create greater dignity in the world. She's done so with courage. In 2011, when I was still the president and artistic director of Creative Time, I had the honor of working with Tanya to present her dream project of fighting to, well, her dream project of raising attention for immigrant rights with Immigrant Movement International, along with our partners at the Queen's Museum, with then director Tom Finkelpearl. Tom is here today, and as the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, he has paved the way for Tanya to be an artist in residence at the New York City Department of Immigrant Affairs. Tom, thank you. Like Weiwei, Tanya is an ardent fighter for the inalienable, inalienable human right to free and creative expression. For this, she too has received globally prestigious awards and recognition, and for this, she too has been arrested. In 2014, she was apprehended by the Cuban government for attempting to stage a performance, mind you, one she had done previously, in her native Havana's Revolution Square, for simply planning to set up a microphone where citizens could express their dreams for Cuba. Tanya was arrested multiple times and spent months under house arrest. When it comes to what's right, Tanya never backs down. So just recently, she announced she'll be running for president of Cuba when Raul Castro steps down, as he has said he will do in 2018. Believe me, I know Tanya. She's serious about this. Right, Tom? Yep. Of course, this is also absurd, as Cuba is not a democracy. Tanya always gets right to the heart of things. She once told me, I don't want to make an art that points at the thing, politics in this case. I want to be the thing. Weiwei, welcome home to Brooklyn. Activist, architect, curator, filmmaker, even sometimes a pop star, Weiwei is perhaps the most widely recognized artist in the world. Today, he returns to Brooklyn for the first time since his legendary detainment by the Chinese government in 2011 that led to four years of house arrest. Brooklyn holds a special place in Weiwei's heart as it is where he first lived when moving to New York City in the 1980s, and it's home to his retrospective here at our museum in 2014. How many of you got to see that retrospective? Pretty mind-blowing, right? And by the way, our, our former director, Arnold Lehman, sends his love to all of you. He also holds a special place in our heart from the show that it was clear that there is no holding way, way back either, and there is no project too big for him, from his collaboration on the Bird's Nest Stadium for Beijing's 2008 Olympics, sunflower seeds in 2010 scattered millions of hand-painted, handmade porcelain seeds in the Tate's Turbine Hall, to his recent work calling attention to the Syrian refugee crisis, Weiwei, we thank you. You may recall that at Weiwei's retrospective at the museum, it included a site-specific installation of 600 bicycles in our great hall. And today, we share with you our brand new edition of I Weiwei Bikes Made Just For Us. It's a very limited edition, and it does know what, a, what no other artwork, I think, has ever done. It looks great as you ride around it on the street, as well as on the wall. So you, too, can have order one today. 
Check it out, it's at the entrance of the auditorium. And I want to thank Listen Gallery for their support and Wovo uh, who's storing this and actually showing it at their storage and viewing space for us. So who's up for holiday shopping today? I'd also like to thank one of um, our dearest friends, the one and only Larry Warsh, whose commitment to Ai Weiwei and to his presence at the Brooklyn Museum is endless. I want to thank Sharon Matt Atkins, our Vice Director for Exhibitions and Collections Manager, for her tireless energy toward the 2014 retrospective and her ongoing relationship with Weiwei. And also Dana Gluck, our Special Projects whiz kid, whose determination made today's program possible. And last but not certainly least, I'd like to thank our trustees and board of advisors who are here today that have made everything possible at the Brooklyn Museum. Stephanie Ingracia, Jill Bernstein, Ellen Taubman, Victoria Rogers, Leslie Beller, Nicola Durovchek, Anya Rubix, Susan Sills. Thank you very much for what you do for the museum. Now, yes, I think they deserve applause. And finally, I want to say that we're in the midst of a tremendous moment in New York for Ai Weiwei. In addition to today, his only public speaking engagement in, during his visit to New York, we are also all fortunate to have an opportunity to witness four simultaneous exhibitions in November. At Listen Gallery in Chelsea, hello to our, our, our Listen family, to two shows with Mary Boone, and a show at Deitch Projects with our very dear friend, Jeffrey Deitch. So without further ado, it is my absolute honor and deepest pleasure to welcome our special guests to the stage. Tanya Ai Weiwei, please join us. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for coming on a Saturday. And um, I want to thank uh, um, Anne Pasternak, who always have wonderful, wild uh, ideas, uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, I just want to thank the staff of the museum for all the help and assistance in this. And uh, I want to welcome Ai Weiwei um, today. And um, we're going to start having a conversation. Uh, I'm going to put some images of his work. I'm going to ask him questions and then so on. And then you guys can um, uh, ask us questions. Um, I, um, I have to say that uh, when Anne first uh, emailed me to tell me that, uh, about this idea, the first thing I thought about was uh, the face of my interrogators in Cuba when they know we are here together today. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure they don't want us to exchange notes. So, okay, but hopefully we do. Um, Okay, so here, um, of course, we're starting uh, to see um, when you were in uh, New York. And, uh, um, of course, in one of your many interviews, you said that you left China to escape the political situation back then. Then you came to New York, uh, and you integrated to the art scene here, no? But then you went back to China. And at the time you were in China, there was this kind of... Um, as we saw it from the West, this kind of uh, effervescent and enthusiastic and critical Chinese art scene when you came back, and you were, of course, help on that very much. Um, but then now it looks like from here that, um, that, uh, that uh, you are one of the very few dissident voices in the art uh, in China. So my question, because in Cuba we, we're going through the same phenomenon, where we had a very uh, critical mass of artists that now are very interested in the market and, and, and in pleasing the visitors, let's say. Uh, so my question would be, if you can like, tell me more or less, how was the process in China, in the art scene in China, to go from this kind of critical subversive scene to this kind of more commodity art scene, if that's correct? Thank you. <coughs> First. <coughs> Uh, this is Ai Weiwei, and uh, first I'm very grateful to have a chance to, to be in the museum. And uh, two years ago I had a show here. That time I was not allowed to come, but I do feel I'm already part of this uh, institution. I think uh, 
as a Brooklyn Museum is a very special institution. Libido Off Center have its own unique um, way, and uh, it's very important for the uh, art um, com community in both metropolitan area and in Brooklyn. And uh, thank you for for bear with me for this past next hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, before we come to here, I, I start to take selfies with uh, many of you mm -hmm. in the garden. I thought that would be nice because outside is such a beautiful day, and uh, we can just stay there taking selfies for the next two hours. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, to answer the question, is China is a very different situation. Uh, it's very similar to Cuba, I should say. Since the uh, uh, end of 1970, uh, I'm one among the first group of so-called avant-garde. It's not so avant-garde. It's a <laughs> little different from the, what the government is doing. But that already being seen as a uh, uh, rebelling or dissident. So uh, it's the name always given by Western media. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that creates some kind of um, a group which uh, uh, using the Western, uh, um, more Western influence and doing works. But uh, of course, that uh, is not really um, influential in the society like China, I, I assume in Cuba also, mm. because basically there's no platform. So those people are really in a terrible situation, and, uh, but uh, the only attraction would be to foreign uh, embassies or, mm. or foreign media. So then I left. I, I, I spent about 12 years in the United States, 10 years in, in, in this city, uh, in mostly in Manhattan. I spent about uh, a few months in Williamsburg, uh, Lorimer mm -hmm. Street. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> my landlord, his name is uh, Rabinovich. And <laughs> <laughs> I guess, and, and at that time, that, that, that area is very quiet. It's no, of course, there's no artists in that area. It's, as Parsons students, we, we rent an apartment. And uh, yeah, it's a very mixed neighborhood. So uh, talk about uh, the art today in China. There's very little um, question about uh, uh, or e even in relating to political issues, because that is clearly forbidden. And uh, so after generations has been punished, uh, if you have any opinion or any, uh, even just attitude, can be openly uh, questioning the authority, which will be punished. So. Uh, my father's generation and uh, the same. You know, my father was a poet and was uh, sent to exile for years. And uh, so it's very clear it's not allowed. Even China has been booming in many ways, just like the West, you know, or even in many ways has much more freedom than the West because the, the law and the establishment is not there. And uh, seems everything goes, but only one thing it doesn't happen is so-called freedom or freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So I think when there's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom. And uh, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but <laughs> and I often make a, a silly statement, so mm -hmm. forgive me. And uh, yeah, to to see. Um, then the art in general is trying to meet the demand of the uh, Western market. Mm -hmm. You know, whoever pays, then you know it become a trendy and uh, you know mm -hmm. attract all those students. And uh, and yeah, that's the condition. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's the same in Cuba at the moment. <laughs> How, uh, it's interesting that you talk about um, this history of repression, of course, that is so long there. In our case, we also have generations of people who are be have been afraid. So when you have uh, the censorship is starting in the house. Like your father or your mother say, don't do this because you're going to have a problem. Uh, and so it's interesting. A lot of people say about you that you are very courageous. So I wonder what advice will you give to somebody that feel uh, afraid of repercussions? Yeah, it's a good question because uh, in such a large society, we have 1.3 billion people. And uh, you rarely to see one stand up in any kind of uh, um, principle. So you, I often ask why. I, I think, you know, if your child be poisoned by, by some kind of uh, pollution in the milk powders, that could the, the devastating over 30 million children. And uh, where is their parents? You know? mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, when an earthquake would put 5,000 students under those rebels and all dead, you know, where are, are those parents? And uh, then we understand this society is such a very established uh, communist. You know, it's, it, it comes to every level. So it will really erase or, or, or silent any person from a very, uh, very bottom uh, condition. So each family, like if your child uh, was killed in earthquake, would have seven officials just focus on one parent. They become like warfare and uh, give pressure to you because you can lose your job, you can, you can never find a peace in your life if you fight. And uh, which make, uh, it's all under the name so-called stability of a, a society or a harmonious society, but it really at the cost of every family, everybody and uh, sacrifice the very essential beliefs of justice or fairness. Mm. So naturally, if you do anything, your parents will say, it already affect your, your daddy's job and your, mm. your sister-in-law's job. You know, they would check on, on mm. every aspect. It's a very, very sophisticated system. <laughs> And very in detail. They go into the person in detail. They're no, not they're talking about the, the they're very detailed. They're very precise. Very precise. And they make sure there's no yeah. uh, single voice can be heard. And they use a lot of resources. I had four interrogators. They rotate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm like, what? Do they have nothing else to do, these people? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's interesting how they spend so much money the, and, and resources. Another, I mean, talking about that made me think, um, and preparing for this, I saw a lot of your re um, interviews, and, and I was saying, wow, a lot of things look very similar in terms of, um, as you say, how the state respond to these threats. They are just human uh, humans asking for the rights or, or asking the wrong question on the view. And for example, in Cuba, it's very uh, normal that the state police um, work with the Minister of Culture. Like for example, in my case, you had uh, the head of the Arts Council in Cuba going to a meeting uh, to talk to the artists who are in the School of the Arts, to professional students, together with the a person from the Department of a State Police and talk openly, like, yeah, we are collaborating, no problem. Like, it's very interesting. So I wonder, just to change some, uh, to see if I can get some wisdom here about how to fight them there. Um, how, how did they, what kind of um, strategies they have used uh, in terms of with the artists? Like, how is this collaboration with the state police or the state security um, and with the arts? Do they also have these things where the Minister of Culture is trying to intervene? Or, for example, in Cuba now, there are this list of artists 
who are the official artists, you know? And if you're not in the list, if you say something wrong, you are not in the list. So none of these people here, when they go to Cuba, will see those artists. So I wonder if, how, how do they do it there? How do they do that stuff there? How do they control the information and the, with the artist? Before, uh, it was much easier before the so-called free economy. It was much easier because everyone belonged to a working unit. Mm -hmm. Not only you, every, every family. And, uh, and uh, school or, or street, even the, they don't have for this kind of community, but on every street they would have uh, one, um, how do you call it, some, someone in the street just to watch or to, to, to maintain some kind of security code. So you all have a communist uh, control. So anything happens, police or state police, and uh, on also street uh, community worker, which mm. is also work for the party, and uh, also the unit, uh, the working unit, uh, they also have a party <laughs> representative. They would all come together, they all, all, all be informed. And uh, if you're in school, the school teacher and, uh, and the principal all informed. So you are really, uh, yeah, in a society which um, clearly being uh, watched and trained and just, you know, this is very professional. That's what they do, and they they, they do uh, the best. You know, so it's uh, it's very simple for. Mm. For them, when there is no clear law to to protect uh, uh, freedom of speech, and the judicial system is not a, uh, is not independent, and uh, there is no free press, there is no uh, so simple. Simply, you anybody who act uh, on its own mind, which is very rare because the education already told you this is not possible. But if something happened like someone like me uh, is kind of a little bit naive or crazy in, in a certain sense, <laughs> and uh, then can, you can easily be sent to a mental hospital because there must be something wrong. Even, even you know this is what will hurt you or hurt your family, and you still uh, not to not to listen and uh, still act the way you do must be something wrong, you know, so. Hmm. I, I have a question. Um, of course I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, but following on that. Seems uh, you have too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, following on that, um, at least one of the ways of attack, at least during you know, socialist or communist time, at least in Cuba, is that you, if you dissent, you are representing the far right crazy wing of the immigrants of your country in another place or something like that. They, they accuse you of being a mercenary of the CIA. They accuse you to be like uh, um, somebody, you know, like an ignorant. They accuse of so many things if you dare to criticize. And um, I was wondering, what is your, uh, in the political spectrum, where do you situate yourself? Um, what's the question? Where, where, do you, <laughs> where do you situate yourself politically in all the variety oh, of options oh. that uh, oh. sometimes some um, people have? I don't have a clear uh, political um, party or, or so-called left wing or right wing, I, I consider myself as an individual, and uh, which I, I think always would be the strongest position you, uh, one person can, can have as an individual. And uh, that's, that's how my voice is being uh, heard about and how many, many people see me as an example. Um, because they, they can sense uh, what uh, um, an individual can, can be. And uh, of course, all those with the help of the internet. Without the internet, I would not be uh, I will be today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 
uh, ironically, uh, I, I was set up an uh, internet by state. Uh, <laughs> the, that time I was an uh, architect and I was quite famous architects in China. They said, uh, you have to have this uh, block. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, 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 that's, that 2005, China just set up their own block uh, called Sina. They said, you are the perfect person to have this block. <laughs> 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 which turned out to be true. That time, <laughs> that time I, I never touched the computer and don't know how to type. They said, no problem, we give you an assistant to do that. <laughs> so that, that, that girl is very convincing and I, I think, it's, why not? You know, I always curious and I want to learn. And once I touched the computer, it uh, take me like half day to think of the one line to, to put on my <laughs> first post because I write down uh, to express yourself need a reason but to express, uh, to express yourself is the reason. That take me half day just to use my one finger to tap it. <laughs> and, uh, and since that I, I, I I realize I, I don't want to sleep anymore. I, you know, <laughs> every day I spend my time on on, on internet. I, I just pick up any um, topic. Is, I start. Freedom to, is addictive. Yeah. Huh? Freedom is addictive. It's very <laughs> addictive. It's 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 uh, yeah. I had some kind of illusion, and uh, I I even said it give me three years. I will change everything. <laughs> And uh, they gave me two and a half years, they put me in jail. <laughs> so it's almost there. <laughs> I got uh, like 27 million people uh, uh, visit my blog and they repost everything I post. And uh, each day I would post uh, one to three articles. You know, every morning I just open the newspaper, I see some topic, I start to talk about it. And I got so overexcited. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it started. <laughs> uh, well, they never know what they, you know. They're... Let's go back to the um, to art. Uh, this is one of my um... art. What is art? Exactly. <laughs> now you have the question. Um, this is one of the images I am more. I feel more connected to because I, I see art as a gesture. But I wonder. I want to hear from you. Do you consider this more like a gesture, like an image? Uh, how do you talk about this? I this? did this uh, 1995 uh, around that time. That time I was not really an uh, active artist. I had this. Uh, 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 Nikon camera, which you know, I have three, so you can take uh, a, a very fast uh, photo in one second or less than a second. So I showed my brother, so he said, Please take the photo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, he missed at the first one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch it. <laughs> so I happened I have a second vest, which is. It's a uh, Han Dynasty, 2,000 years old. So we, <laughs> and uh, I told him, if you miss this one, then that's over. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's, he's a good photographer. He catches that uh, image. <laughs> then that image just stays there um, unpublished for about over 10 years. You know, I never think it's a serious. I never think it's a, uh, it, It's more or less like a joke, but... It take a serious person long, long, long time to make that joke. I think, uh, and I, and I, I didn't being recognized as an artist till 2004 or five to make my first show. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, already 10 years past. So during that time, I realized um, on my resume, there's always a period of time, like 10 years or five years, I have nothing to write, you know, I didn't do anything. I would just, uh, I did something even not mentionable in this, uh, in here. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, of course, I, I printed out, then now become 
uh, I have sorry to say this become a, a serious image, you know, but but it really come as a joke. Yeah. When uh, when I saw, um, and this is a gossip that I want to share with you, so you clarify the gloss, the gossip. Mm -hmm. um, there was um, an artist um, called Caminero, who went to the Pan Museum and he took one of your pieces and broke it. Mm -hmm. And it was said that it was inspired on your own work. Um, how do you react to that when you heard about it? Like uh, he, after he did it, he apologized to me. I, I think I, I write to him. I said uh, something like, "Yes, you have rights to state your mind or to make a gesture, but also you have to bear some kind of responsibility for that gesture." You know any. Any act we take, we have to bear responsibility. It doesn't matter. Otherwise, the attitude is never free. So, of course, I I I totally understand him. You know, I would do. I would not say I would do same thing. I did same thing. So I don't really know what is the last result. I think they they did a little bit manner charge with some kind of community work hours oh. or something. Yeah. But uh, you know, this is. Uh, but I, I mentioned, uh, you know, this is. Uh, you normally do to your own uh, property. <laughs> uh, it's not encouraged to do somebody else's property because uh, in the United States we all know that's a violation of mm -hmm. something. You know. Well, but. <laughs> But at the same time, our work creates certain reactions, no? Um, hmm. our, the work and the, and the way we see art as in a very, you know, um, iconoclastic way, let's say, also create this uh, excitement from the audience to do something similar. So I, I think did that in private, my home, and I don't encourage anybody to come out of this room. You know, this is a museum, you know, it's, if you okay. really uh, have to be careful. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that because it was a lot of gossip and I didn't know what was true. So, okay, so here we have, talking about that. Uh, okay, um, I'm, um, you have uh, said that um, the reason why the government and this kind of um, non freedom of expression can survive there is because they limit the information to ordinary people, so they cannot make any judgment or anticipate because they don't have enough information. That's a quote from one of your interviews, no? Um, and you say we have to speak the truth and stand for the people and not for power. My question is, do you think change in China, or in China specifically, uh, will come from um, top down or from bottom up? How, how do you uh, grassroots? How do you see uh, the possibility of create change? Yeah, there's uh, many discu discussions where the change will come from. You know, it's from top down or from bottom up. It's like we talk about uh, when spring will come. It's come from the the frozen river. The, the ice start to melt. Or from the tip of the tree, the you know the first green will come. I think mostly it comes from the temperature. So we have a trust on sunshine. With you know, when sun comes up, we all think, oh, what a nice day. Why we have to sit inside to in the darkness to to mm. listen to this old Chinese guy talking about those <laughs> things. You know, so I think it comes from, from everywhere. Comes from you and me and everywhere, and come from the freedom of speech. Come from we defend the very essential values, which is about justice, fairness, and we saw that it comes from nowhere. It will never come. Mm, okay. Yeah, and then we have another version of the same work. <laughs> now I have more reason to have this. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think we both criticize our own countries, but also we criticize the West. Both of us are critic on both. Um, at the moment, there is something that is happening in Cuba, and I wonder if it happened in China as well, at some point, where people from the United States and Europe go there, and they actually um, uh, self-censor themselves. 
They go there and they see things that are wrong, but they self-censor. They accept the government doing things to people that they would not accept in their own places as a matter of principle. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of these people, when you talk to them, they say, no, uh, you know, you have to be careful because I want to position myself in the future of Cuba, or in the future I have a space. And I think they don't understand that the future of Cuba is now. It's done by their own actions today. And th that's how you shape the future of Cuba. So I was, my, my, um, my question was actually, um, how do you think, or what do you think is our responsibility with others and with other places? Yeah, <clears throat> I often be asked by same question by foreign, um, well, I would say the, the foreign um, politicians or businessmen or powerful person, they said, we, we, whatever we, we do may hurt you or would help you, or what is your position on that? I always tell them, there's no m my position. What's your position on that? And, you know, how do you think it's right or wrong? You know, you don't have to think about it. it may hurt somebody or to, you know, to, be, to be courteous, but just do what you think is right. So I think uh, that's uh, the only, uh, I think every day we have to ask the same question, you know, do we really can tolerate this kind of thing happen, this kind of society, this kind of suffering? And, uh, and there's no excuse for not to, to give out the, your voice uh, in any circumstance. So that's my answer, yeah. I wish more people say, do that. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm doing a selection of what I like, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, so here, um, I want to make a little statement before we talk about this. I want to thank you, because in this series of work, you put a Cuban dissident. And I want to thank you because it's not normal that these people who are normal in Cuba are anonymous. And uh, they, they actually very brave, and they stand in front of the government with nothing but their own bodies. And I want to thank you for that, that it was included in this list of uh, important uh, uh, dissidents and important fighters for freedom. So that's my personal on that. So um, I uh, want to go to, back to, okay, let me see. Sorry, I, you can see I don't, I'm not into sculpture, so I'm like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but we can come back when you ask questions. You can see all the images. Okay, so um, this is a very interesting work. I, was, uh, I didn't know about this before now. Um, and I was thinking um, it is kind of a representation of a very intense experience you had. And I was wondering how do you um, negotiate the entrance of this very intense experience to places like a museum or the art world? Um, how do you negotiate that? How do you do the transition? How you, um, what are your tactics or your techniques to invite people to think about these issues that are so distant from their, their experience? <laughs> um, first, I, in my life, I never negotiating with the uh, art uh, world, not mm -hmm. a gallery, not a, not a museum. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so uh, privileged and lucky to have a chance to show in very important uh, um, institutions and to be associated with many, many uh, interesting people. But uh, for me, an uh, art is the way I defense and uh, there's no negotiation. This is uh, what I do. Take it or not to, not to have me. So, and uh, yeah, that's, that's the way. It's always been like that. And from the starting point, on the, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be uh, till the end. So, but not uh, everybody has this kind of uh, privilege or lucky luck. And uh, of course, you have to consider many things. You know, the museum is built for general public, and uh, very often they use the, the taxpayers' money. So you have to have some kind of give and take in, in, in the display. 
and uh, you have to be a little bit, uh, you know, even you just like to eat spicy food, but when you have gas, you also have to mm. cook some, uh, mm. something like, you know, now we have a lot of vegetarians and, uh, you know, <laughs> we have to be courteous to that. You know. mm. Yeah, we're in democratic society, so. And here we have um, an image of um, here, where you put the flowers mm -hmm. for the camera. How do you think aesthetics can disarm repression? Or do you think it could it can disarm I, repression? I think this is a very interesting topic because my, my house has been surrounded over dozens of uh, surveillance cameras. I, I ask them, say, why you need so many? You know, it's such a waste. <laughs> is that some, called, some kind of system breakdown or you prevent something? They said, no, you don't understand. Some belong to the street, some belong to the local uh, uh, you know, uh, governor, some belong to the state governor. So they don't trust each other, they have layers. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if they ever get together. So I, uh, I decide to also have my own private camera. <laughs> so each day, uh, because I don't have a chance to travel, I think that's not right. How can you limit somebody's chance to travel? But also there's no space for argument. There's no sense of... Mm. Discu discussion, you know, it's, if there's a little bit sense of discussion, then everything can be solved. So I said, okay, under this kind of condition, what I can do is just put the bike there and each day to put the fresh flowers to give to myself, to celebrate my, my impossibility to move. Mm. So I did this day by day, and uh, you know, this is from a one image grabbed uh, from our videos, you know, which uh, uh, our own surveillance camera. And uh, after 600 days, or oh, each day we also post uh, whatever is on the, yeah. on the internet. It generates a lot of uh, attention. So on the internet, there's uh, on that period of time, there's called uh, Freedom for, uh, for Flowers for Freedom. And uh, each day I will receive hundreds of uh, flowers from all over the world. It's become some kind of movement. I think this kind of thing very, very disturbing for the authority. Yes. <laughs> and uh, they like to be clean. They like to see, okay, the voice, is not there, but they cannot really s stop this kind of action because there's no clear reason for them to stop. They also have their own reasoning and their own system. So to, to put our flowers there, they only say, well, we can, can you not to do it? Mm. Well, you know, they, they also negotiate. So I said, uh, that's not possible, you know. You, you have my passport, I just put my fresh flowers there, and you know, this is not possible. So when you have this kind of negotiation, why you can win only because they know if they stop you or generate something else, which mm. will be even worse than this. Yeah. So I think this is always a way to bargain. Mm. So I'm a very good uh, person in that, I've been proved. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, I know. And also, they, they, sometimes they know they're going to look bad. I mean, in those but, uh, yeah. rights fighting, many mm -hmm. people always have ideas, big ideas, but they forget to do very small things, which can relate to everybody. Absolutely. And it, it's, it requires determination, and it requires uh, uh, some kind of skill. Mm. And I think that's very important because that brings a detail to life, a, a, enriches our life. You know, it's just like the color or shapes of each individual flowers. Mm. It, it only comes when you have that. If you don't have that, you don't have flowers, you know. Yeah. Mm. No, they, they, they know that very well and they sometimes know they're going to look bad if they repress you because it's little gestures, but they want to show the power. They want to show they are the one in power. But um, another thing um, um, that I uh, wanted to ask you is um, 
Uh, one, one thing I want to say before the, talking about this piece is that it was funny in Cuba, um, <coughs> now I think the censorship, who work, of course, with the actual state police, before they censor your work, when they, you're going to show, they go to the exhibition to see what is showing, they say, no, this, no, this, no. Then they went to the uh, studio of the artist, say, this, no, this, no. Now they imagine the work you want to do, and they, they repress you for the thing you haven't even think about yet. <laughs> So it's very <laughs> crazy the day they position themselves in our heads, no? But going back to the art world, um, you have made this uh, wonderful piece um, from the cameras, and um, I, I have, a, I mean, this is a question that happens a lot around you and around any successful political artist, me, you, everybody. They, there is always this question about the relation, to, the relation between the political. Um, a statement we want to do, and the success we have uh, in in the art world, or the success we have, or, or some some uh, political artists like you have, in the kind of commercial world. And my question is: um, Do you think, uh, or do you struggle with art um, as a medium of e efficiency? And do you, for the things you want to say, and if you think that this tension between the money that you receive for your art and the political statement you want to do is something um, that uh, changes the desire you have to communicate uh, the issues. I mean, how do you re relate to this uh, well, conundrum <clears throat> that we have? Uh, your question is not so clear, I, I, but I, I try to... I was trying to be polite. I try to answer it. I, yeah, I know, but uh, that's not <laughs> the right way, you know. <laughs> I, I think uh, being a political artist, a so-called political artist, you're first thing you're human. You know, you're not uh, just making some uh, uh, statement without skill. You can play the game, you think you're smart enough, and you also can play all kinds of games because that's about life. It's not about being political or not. Mm. I mean, surviving is a political, and we are living in a society we have to respect a human behaving, and that could include so-called economically success. If I've been politically very active, but uh, financially very poor, I will feel sorry for myself, also sorry for the basic values I'm fighting for. I'm not successfully communicating, I'm not delivering my, my uh, knowledge, and I, I never really create a language or a skill for so-called ideology. But is that a clear answer for you? No, no, but I have a follow-up question. Like, but sometimes the, uh, those objects or those images circulate in the places where their political um, friction or the political message is being erased be because in which hands they are or how they circulate. So they take other um, meanings, you know? So. Of course, there's always misunderstanding or misinterpretation. You know, we can never really control the, how the world, and it's like you jump in the river, you don't know where that would uh, uh, take you or, or really push you, or which side of the, you know, the border you can reach. But still, the decision is, are you going to jump into it, or are you going to still think you can survive in this? Hmm. Do you think there will be for you other mediums other than art or in art that will be more uh, efficient to show this kind of struggle or I don't think so I don't think I don't trust the media mm -hmm. even this most important uh, thing also myself uh, as a media but uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we change all the time and we also uh, have different kind of uh, intellectual or, mm. or uh, levels. So I, I, I also I think in the public media, people uh, there's really uh, very surface and very it's never go that deep. And mm. uh, maybe because the viewers doesn't really want to be that deep. You know, people just want to see uh, mm. what can be seen and uh, you know what matters in the very short time. Mm. Talking about, um, let me show this work. 
Um, I want to a little bit more in detail about this idea of ethics and politics. And um, as you might know, <laughs> this yeah. image generated a lot of criticism and uh, generates a very adverse reaction. Uh, and uh, the fact that you were posing like Alan Kurdi, a three-year-old uh, kid who, who drowned in the shore of Turkey, it was seen as a kind of, um, uh, you know, as a kind of the, the substitution of one body from another, one body that uh, actually captured the magnitude of the Syrian refugee crisis uh, by another body of an artist or activist or somebody who, you know, is not going through this. So it did create some sort of ethical dilemma, you know, that a lot of artists discussed. And um, I wanted to know how you react, react to the claims that were done when you showed this image and everybody uh, start questioning your position. I don't react to them. Okay. They only, my only position is let them react to me. Okay. And but, I made it very clear. And uh, so. Okay, but, but okay, you don't react, that's, that's your right. But um, do you understand um, or how do you, th how do you see um, the way in which us as artists intervene these situations that are not our own situations? and the responsibility we have to not take away from the situation, the light. You know, because in this case, I'm, it was... I'm, uh, I'm an artist, I'm not a priest. I don't, I'm not necessarily saying what my act would be right or wrong. I raise questions, I put myself into those questions, and uh, if I do care like everybody else care, I will never become an artist. I'm different. Mm. And uh, I will always be different. And how do you feel with this image? Okay. And how do you uh, to answer okay. you very clear, yeah. I don't give a damn shit about it. Right. <laughs> okay. A last question about this image. How do you feel um, that an image like this, that was your personal image statement? like anything is an image. Yeah, you know, I we know. have a much, much worse image in the world. We yeah. can always accept it. You know, just take it or fuck it. Okay. So, but sometimes we have to fuck the artist too. Do it. <laughs> okay, we have five minutes and we come back. Just do it. Uh, <laughs> no, but I think it's an interesting conversation because um, right now, uh, political art is something Do that you is know how many people died this year? Just tell me the number. How many people died in, in... Hundreds of thousands of people. How many people died in past year? Not hundreds of thousands of people in this ocean. Just tell me the number. I know there are millions of people. No, 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 no. As a political artist, just tell me how many people was wrong in past year. I don't have the exact uh, okay. number right now. That's, that's the right okay. answer. 3,800 people dropped. Okay. I'm not working on the same increases. At I know, the moment, I know. You are you're a partially political artist, or you just, yeah, yeah. or a Cuban uh, political yeah, artist. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not like that. I'm very seriously about what I'm doing. Yeah, but I think that, what, okay, where does seriousness reside? Where does seriousness of your work reside? You say you're very serious about it. Where do you position the seriousness? I know what I'm doing. I do clear research. And I'm, I'm more deeply involved than most people you can even imagine about. Mm -hmm. You know, we did over 1,000 hours of documentary films on refugee situation. Personally, I interviewed over 100 politicians. That makes some sense. I traveled a dozen nations in Middle East, in, in many, many nations. I don't, I don't even want to mention it. I visited over dozens of camps. Mm -hmm. I see all those children, those women, those pregnant, those old people, and I, I share what they, they feel and what's in their fear or what they desire or what, how they're being refused. Mm -hmm. So talk about this topic, I will be too emotional even to answer you on this stage. You just watch my film, it will come out next year. So what do you think art can do to solve this problem or to address this problem? Art can do to teach ourselves to be a real person. 
first, we need the first-hand knowledge. We cannot just blah, blah, blah. We have to be real, and we have to be involved. Okay, I'm involved, so. <laughs> okay, good. So, no, I think, I think there is also a tendency to see art as, right now, as, a, as, a, as something that can collaborate with other, um, you know, areas of, you know, politics or society. So I think, personally, that the art, um, right now, art is extremely important to understand uh, not only the situation, but also to solve it. And I think, in a way, um, in a way, um, I don't know if, uh, what do you think about this, but in a way, may, maybe one of the biggest challenges we have as artists today is actually not so much the modes of production, like what is happening in the mode of production, but how can we implement the ideas in society at large? I don't know if you... Um, can you ask again? Again, yeah. Sure. So, I... I uh, you know, for many, many years, um, the discussion has been about the ethics or the, or the ways in which uh, production of an artwork is made. And I feel that now this discussion is very old and we have uh, very good um, arguments about it. And I feel that now it's more about how can we implement art inside society, not only to look at something, uh, not only to generate something people can look at it, but something that generates a reaction, actually, that is about caring, a reaction that is about being in, uh, involved, and also maybe even imagine other ways to solve the problems through our creativity that maybe politicians or, I don't know, organizations have not had the time uh, or the... I don't do. think uh, we can find a way to solve the problem. I think the problem will always be there, and, uh, but we are not going to be always be there. So we're using our time trying to solve our own problem. You know, we are part of the problem. And uh, yeah, if I make it simple, it's like that. Okay. Uh, so on that note, I want to see if uh, anybody has a question. Uh, I did a project where I used one minute of free speech, and in one minute people say a lot of things, so I will encourage people to use a minute to make their question to I. And, um, yeah. Anybody? Yeah, if we make it short, we still have time to take selfies. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a question, we ask that you line up on either side of the aisles and use the microphone. What? Uh, hello, I, I don't have anything to say for the whole minute. I was just wondering what is your thoughts about Russia and how Russia and China becoming best pals? So, thank you. For you? For you. No, it's for him, no? <laughs> She just mentioned your name. It's for who's you. The, who's yeah. the person for? For you. He's, he's, for me. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Iwoiwei. <laughs> uh, I think uh, this question is very general. You know, how China and Russia become a power. And they all, their neighbors, Russian and China, it's uh, probably one or uh, two of the biggest uh, nation uh, in, in that uh, uh, area or that uh, geographically. I don't think they ever can become a friend. And uh, it's very hard for anybody to become a friend of Russia. <laughs> and, uh, and China is very practical. They, are, they have to have Russian as uh, some kind of political allies. It's just like uh, United States and uh, Canada, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but uh, they also, uh, yeah, they also share the, the problems. Uh, they, they, they often have been blamed together, but, you know, the world is not just United States or Europe. You have also uh, balanced uh, counter uh, powers. 
and not necessarily is bad. You know, sometimes it also is needed. That's my personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, hello. I've been a big fan of your work. I've seen it in Alcatraz at San Francisco, and I was also here two years ago, so it's a great honor um, to hear you speak today. And my question is, um, I know a lot of your work deals with very emotional subjects, just like um, with the work you did two years ago with the, you made the snake with the backpacks of the Shushan children, and just the whole concept of that series I felt was so emotional. So how do you like reconcile that emotion with your work? Like how do you approach topics that are so overwhelmingly tragic or like so incredibly sad? How do you work with topics like that? Well, as an artist, I'm uh, always very emotionally involved. You can see even I'm on stage, I'm very emotionally involved with the topics. And I cannot by doing something at the same time not to really believe in it. So that I rather not to do it, you know. It's, uh, uh, that's how it comes out, comes out like that. But the artworks you see is always just some fragments. And I should say my emotions are much deeper than those works. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's you always have to find a simple language, uh, which you know, the language can, can be shared. Hi. Um, of course, we talk about both of you being really kind of brave, risk-taking individuals in order to challenge an oppressive system or to be political at all. But I think there's also kind of bravery and risk involved in being an artist at all anywhere. And so I was wondering if you just have any advice for someone trying to take the plunge and risk to make it as someone in the arts. You're from here? Uh, yeah, from. Should I answer the question or the lady should answer the question? Uh, either of you. Huh? You're both awesome. So. Okay. <laughs> then you go ahead. <laughs> oh, so yeah. Uh, okay. I think um, for me it is about, um, for me it is very easy or is easier, it's not easy, but it's easier to, as an artist, to confront. Um, issues of, um, of politics, of the government, and so on. I think uh, my, uh, what I do, and I wish or more, you know, and I, maybe you could do, I don't know, is that um, to not stay only in the criticism of the outside of the art world, but I think we have the responsibility because we shape the art world, and the art world um, is also our responsibility. And we might have more impact there than we have in the government of China or the government of Cuba. And I think my advice will be that always uh, say uh, what you think is wrong, no matter what the price is, because, you know, it will make you feel so good. <laughs> Thank you. you don't I, I think uh, for me it's very easy. Uh, if you if you look look at Trump, you think that that person is still can be your president. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if you get different answers, so you have to come out some kind of language to say to state your mind. Otherwise, this kind of thing can take over. You know, it's it's crazy, it's dangerous, and it's, it will affect our life. So. But just to be, to act, okay. Hi, this question is for Ai Weiwei. It's also a comment as well. Um, first, I commend you. I think it's incredibly courageous to be a political artist. Um, and so, and I saw your work in San Francisco at Alcatraz as well, and I think it brought a lot of awareness and really, um, I think my question is rooted in that is, what do I do with that awareness now? What do you suggest, big and small acts? If you aren't a political artist, what can I do um, to also hear my voice get heard? I am not very uh, clear what are you asking, but uh, what should what should uh, we do? Like if you're, what you do? yeah, what what to do with uh, the awareness? Take a shower or. <laughs> uh, 
open the window, you know, or or open the refrigerator to see what kind of best thing you can cook today. You know, that's what I do. You know, I I never I never call myself as a political artist. Somebody calls me that, I think it's an insult, but. I, oh, sorry. I accept it. <laughs> Did not mean to I insult accept you. It Why do you think it's an insult? I, because every art has to be political. Okay, if it's nice. not political, it's not yeah. art. So if you just so if you just say somebody is political art, it's insult. You know, you know. That's how I look at the world. Aesthetics always relate to moral, always relate to our philosophy, and uh, it's some art. Can be really out of that, uh, you know, circumstance. I don't understand it. Yeah. Fair. Sorry. That's no, okay. <laughs> Hi, my question is for you, Ai Weiwei. I am also a great, a great fan of yours. I've seen your work in Paris and Athens, and uh, I think we all agree that you're a very famous and successful artist. And one of your ideals is freedom. Do you think that success and fame has given you more freedom, or is it restricting you? I think uh, su successful is uh, if you that words exist. It's just mean you're more recognized, or people give you some kind of security to set, to, to 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 give you some kind of categories. Uh, not to think deeper about this. And uh, for me, it just means responsibility. And I just realized in past a few days, my blood pressure getting much higher. It used to be 90, 90 to 140. Today, this morning before I walk in, it's 116, 150. So that's a bit, uh, you know, that's how I, for me, it's been, if I take so many selfies, I have to shake so many hands, and I have to answer the question repeatedly for very, very essential values. You know, you need patient. You need to be okay. You said, okay, I have to do this. Uh, can I ask another question? So. Sorry, my turn. Um, Hi there. Uh, first of all, I bug you quite a lot on Twitter, so thank you for being responsive and for not blocking me. Um, second of all, I was wondering if you've been in contact with and can therefore provide an update on your former lawyer, Pu Zhichang. Um, what does the future hold for him, and what role, if any, will you play in it? Pu Zhichang was a lawyer in China. Many, many people may not know him, but he's a kind of civil rights lawyer. And uh, he was sentenced for five years, but uh, not really in jail, but stays out at home. You know, it's like uh, you are being sentenced, but you are not being put in jail. As some kind of uh, tolerance. And of course, I, I talk to him, I Skype with him, but not much. Uh, you know, anybody can do. Even he. Uh, like me or, or many people are defending the rights, but not everybody can sense that rights are shared by everybody. You know, it's, it's benefit everybody. It not only benefit somebody in China, but also benefit somebody in Africa. Or So people often see me as somebody who anti-communist. I'm not only anti-communist. You know, it's really, they, they don't understand me. I'm defending humanity, which can be a problem anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, talk about Pu Zhichang. He's, he's still at his home, still worried if he talks to me. And, uh, you know, I try not to bother him too much. Can I get a selfie later? <laughs> what? Can, can we get a selfie later? Is that allowed? You mean private selfie? <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> You mean why I become a, and in some time maybe I start my election, you can sue me for. S <laughs> You're giving away my plan, I. Come on. Yes, we'll do <laughs> selfie together. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, this is a question for Ai Weiwei. Um, one of the 
one of the uh, strongest way to fight anti-establishment in the West is to use humor. And I think about France and America, but in France the conversation about art and politics has a lot to do with a certain kind of humor. So my question to you is, how are you inspired by humor? Are you, what is your kind of humor? And are you, do you think humor is a, an efficient way, uh, no matter where you are, to fight whatever your political side is? You, you use the words humor? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, humor, yeah. So what is humor? So w what is humor, in a way? Yeah, yeah my, my question is, what is humor? <laughs> Tell me, what is humor? It's a comedy, making something funny. Ah, what is humor? Uh, so. Yeah, I understand. Ha, 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 ha. To me, to me, it seems that you're, you're, um, everybody has his own kind of humor. Humor. Um, you're definitely uh, within the realm of. Uh, Use humor or not humor, we are act funny anyway. So don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Hi. Um, this is for Ai Weiwei. Um, nice to hear you in person. Um, a little while ago, I, I watched a, uh, a YouTube video of you, like being interviewed, and about art. And you said that um, the most art is not something someone can, something can, someone can teach you. It's about your own motivation and experiences and interests. And you said the most important thing was to go out and see stuff. So I took that advice to heart. Last year, I skipped a lot of art class. I went up to a lot of galleries and saw a lot of stuff, and it really did help me. Um, but I guess my question to you is. Um, I was wondering if you can give us just some key points like that you took out of your time here in New York and what kind of shaped your artistic development and what made you come to that conclusion of the fact that art is not something someone could teach you. It's for you. I guess this one, ask me. Uh, um, I, I don't know, I don't know how to answer this actually. Um, I, I spent uh, 12 years in New York. If I think back, the most valuable thing, again, from my experiences as an outsider, I never, even I, I looked at all the galleries, the galleries I, I, you know, the works I liked or the work I don't like. And I probably see most uh, shows in the 1980s. And, but I still always think, always feel I'm an outsider. I think that being an outsider is very, very important. And uh, probably that's uh, what Duchamp said, uh, young artists should go underground. Underground is a bit poetic, but uh, as a misfit or outsider, I, I think it's, uh, I, I make you uh, very independent. And also, if you can make it, or will make you very, quite uh, independent. That is a very, very uh, in, uh, in, important position for artists. Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, talking to all of us. Um, I was reading a book recently called The Daily Rituals, How Artists Work. It talks about various creative people and how they spend their time every day. Some of them have like uh, routines where they take a lot of various kind of vices. Some of them are like early risers. So I was wondering if you have any kind of daily routine that you take to think about art and come up with new creations and how that routine will be like. You ask recipes? Potentially, or something that you do every day that helps you with your creative work. I think uh, if you think too much about it, you never get it. And uh, sometimes you have to forget about it and just enjoy the moment and enjoy whatever you like. And maybe you find somebody you can sleep together, you know. And, uh, but if you just think about it, I, I think I, I see many people never get it, you know. Thank you. Hello. 
Thank you for coming. And uh, I wanted to ask your opinion on. Uh, uh, sorry, it's such a long line. Uh, or do we have a time limit? Or <laughs> Maybe we can take two or three questions and make like a resume, and then you can answer two or three questions together. Yeah. Instead yeah. Of or one or one. I don't want to make people disappointed because <laughs> it seems quite a long line there. Okay, I'll make my question really short. Uh, what do you think about the social credit system in China? And um, it's uh, the, the system that is purportedly used to rate a citizen's trustworthiness. I was wondering if you have any opinion on that. Do you want to? He asked. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you say that again, please? Um, I've, I've been hearing a lot about a social and credit system. And can you speak system. a little louder? I've been hearing a lot about a social credit system in China where kind of like a credit score, they rate a citizen's trustworthiness. And uh, for both of you guys, what do you guys think about that? You want to, I can hear what you say. But saying. we can be silent for a while. Yeah. We can answer the question being silent. Yeah, I think that's enough. <laughs> like common, common silence, like together. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, next. Thank you. <laughs> just a heads up, we have time for just one more question on each end. Oh, wow, well, OK. So, OK. Hi, uh, I was in Beijing in 2009 when Hu Jintao was still uh, leading the country. And the 789 Art District was a big area in Beijing. There was a lot of growth in the art community there. How have things changed with the current leadership? And what do you see for the future of art in China? Uh, it's very hard to predict the future, but uh, to the, see the present situation. Um, if we talk about art in China, which is really a, a, a should be category because it's so restricted and limited. And uh, whatever we see happenings today in, in, in China, it doesn't really affect the real condition in China. It's mostly made for the market in the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's the situation. You know, it's not only a few artists. There are, there are a few young artists uh, may, may uh, involve their works in, in, in dealing with the situation or their, their real life there. But uh, it can be very difficult because uh, you know uh, uh, there's basically there's no uh, real museums or or criticism or magazines or newspapers which uh, tell about uh, talk about a real um, um, aesthetic argument. It's just. Uh, um, it become like a fashion. It become like a design. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of sad, but it will remain that way for a long time. Um, when a society doesn't have a freedom of speech, you don't you should not expect uh, that much happening. And uh, yeah, that's what happened in China. Shishia. Hi. Um, so this is a question for Ai Weiwei. Um, so a lot of the uh, kind of the, the themes that you speak about, um, freedom to criticize the government, freedom of expression, um, of speech, uh, et cetera, um, seem to be foundationally, or at least kind of we like to think so, foundationally Western ideas um, that I seem to be uh, to some degree at odds with the current political structure um, and cultural structure in, in China. Um, so my question is, um, what does your ideal China look like? Um, and do you think that um, it's possible to achieve that, uh, that goal given um, the kind of uh, foundations that have been built in the country? Um, and where do you think um, we can start to kind of uh, reach your ideal? I think for any place, uh, under any religion or any kind of circumstance, uh, individual freedom, which always uh, and, um, 
uh, defined by freedom of speech. Also, the society need an uh, independent judicial system which have a cl clear law to uh, to guide the uh, the mass behaving or, or individual behaving, and uh, to have an independent uh, press. Those are very important uh, for the basic um, condition of, for any society. Um, not necessarily to say even you do have that, you will be healthy, but can be clearly say if you don't have that, you are, you are really sick. And uh, that's my answer, but I don't, I don't know how, how to achieve that. It takes, uh, sometimes it can take a long time. Thank you. We're going to take one last question over here. Um, this is not a question. I just want to thank you for being here. You're an amazing um, person. This goes for Tanya. Um, thank you for being such an amazing woman, not only for Cuban, but for the American, Latin American artists in general. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks. And the question that follows that is, uh, <laughs> is that uh, you said earlier in the conversation that when we were talking about the person who broke your piece, you said that an artist has to take responsibility for the things that they do. And so when Tanya asked you um, about the photograph uh, that you reenacted the boy who washed up on the shore in Turkey, you accused her of not being a political artist because she did not know an exact number of something that you researched. So how do you explain how that correlates with taking responsibility for your work? And also I'd like to thank Tanya for being up here and being an incredible political artist who maybe should have had also questions. Thank you. <laughs> so, I could you ask, answer that question? <laughs> him? I would like him to answer the question of bearing responsibility. Because I don't know that it's bearing responsibility to tell someone else that they are not an artist because they did not do the same research as you. Is that? I'm, I'm a little. Well, I'd like either of you to respond. Okay. <laughs> no, I think um, uh, I'm going to respond on my work yes, because I, I don't. Um, <laughs> I do, I'm an artist who, I, I, I agree with I that every art is political. Um, some people decide to go, in, their politics is to ignore the political quality of their art and the capacity of being a political um, statement. But uh, in my art, in terms of uh, the responsibility, if that's your question, um, people who have worked with me know that I take more time thinking about what could happen if I do this, then how I'm going to do it, aesthetically speaking. Because the aesthetic is the consequence. For me, political art is art with consequences. And being a political artist means that I have to understand where I position myself with those consequences and also make sure that I do not uh, reproduce what I'm criticizing because that's a very easy thing to say. And uh, yes, I was a little, I, I'm a good student, so I was kind of like, I don't know the exact number, so I blocked. But, um, but I think for me, it's not to know the data. It's not about the data, about the subject you are researching, but it's how to transform that emotion that you're feeling into something useful for the others. Uh, so that's what I do in my work. Well, thank you so much. I just want to say that I really had a great time in the conversation, and I want to invite Iowa Way to continue talking uh, together in Cuba. Good. Thank you. <laughs> and, and here in Brooklyn. So don't get up yet. Stay there for a second. One more second. So, you know, I just want to say that at the Brooklyn Museum, we don't think about a museum only as a temple for art. It is a temple for art. And we don't only see it as a refuge for a place to get away from society, we also see it as a place to lean into society. And we also see it as a forum, a place to come together and share differences and to see one another and to lean into difficult conversations. 
And I have to say, you two were magnificent, mm. sharing your similarities, sharing your differences, and being so honest and vulnerable and sharing that with all of us. So I want to thank you. I happen to be blessed to be able to have artists as friends and have dinner conversations and arguments, just like the kinds of things we saw on this stage today. But it is so rare that you see a public talk and artists have revealed themselves in the way that they did today. So I applaud you both for the courageous work you do and for the courageous conversation you had on the stage today. Thank you. Thank you.